Morning, everybody. So since we're about to uh, begin our study of gas laws next week, um, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a different pre-lecture tutorial since, again, we're coming off of our first year chemistry course. We already have some experience with the gas laws already. And so it's not like we have to learn them from scratch, but sometimes either because we're a little rusty or sometimes because we're a little nervous because you know, we're working on the AP exam, Sometimes it's entirely possible that you might forget the individual gas laws, so Boyle's law or Charles's law or the Gay-Lussac law. And so this is to present you with sort of an alternative approach to the gas laws that should bail you out if you find yourself in that situation. Um, I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine uh, years ago when we were both learning chemistry, and I remember that he told me, well, you know, when it comes to the gas laws, all you have to really know is PV equals NRT. That's it. That's all you need to know. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that 100%, but there is some wisdom in keeping the ideal gas law in mind whenever you deal with gas law problems. So we're going to be going through the ideal gas law in more detail in a few lessons, but we already do know that it takes the form of PV equals NRT. And so let me show you what to do if you're going through sort of a smaller gas law problem and you sort of can't figure out whether you need to multiply, divide, you forget whether the variables are inversely or directly proportional to each other. Suppose we have a problem like the following. It says I have 15 liters of neon at 25 degrees Celsius. And I allow that to expand to 45 liters, okay? What must be the new temperature? Right? And notice that we're working under conditions of constant pressure. And so basically what we have going on here is the volume is changing. Okay. We also know that the temperature is changing, but we're working under conditions of constant pressure. And so what I suggest you do if you sort of start to run a blank is write the ideal gas law. And what you're going to do is you're going to throw all the variables that are changing within the problem on one side of this equation. And you're going to throw all the variables that are staying constant on the other side of the equation. So here we're changing volume and temperature. So I'm going to rearrange the ideal gas law so that volume and temperature are on the same side. And so basically that means moving this T over to the other side of the ideal gas law, since it's being multiplied through on the right-hand side of my equation right now, that means I'd have to divide by temperature on either side. All right, not only that, but over here, this pressure, I also want it on the other side because that's staying constant, all right? So again, since it's being multiplied by the volume, I want to divide by the pressure on both sides of the equation. So if I do that, I get V over T is equal to nr over p. So again, here are all the constants, and there is the relationship that I need between the two variables. So if I just simply copy that, that would be v1 over t1 is equal to v2 over t2. So basically, it sets up Charles's law for you, even if you happen to forget. And so I'm going to go ahead and plug in Right. Also keep in mind, since we're working in uh, degrees Celsius, since we're doing a gas law problem, that means we have to convert that to Kelvin. So 25 degrees Celsius plus 273, that's 298 Kelvin. Okay. So I also want to solve for the new temperature, or T2. So I'm going to rearrange this equation. So T2 is equal to V2 times T1 divided by V1. Okay, if I go ahead and plug in, V2 is 45 liters. Okay, T1 is 298 Kelvin. And V1 is 15 meters. All right, so if I go ahead and do the math, so that's 45 
times 298, and I'm going to divide by 15. That gives me 894 Kelvin. Check. Yep. All right. Now, typically, if you're given a temperature starting degree Celsius, it's usually the polite thing to do to convert that back to Celsius at the end since I'm currently in Kelvin, so I'll subtract 273, and I get 621 degrees Celsius. Okay, let's try one more example of that. Right here, I have an oxygen tank that reads 900 millimeters mercury, okay, when the temperature is 27 degrees Celsius. Uh, since we're going to need this in Kelvin, let's go ahead and do that conversion anyway. So 27 degrees Celsius plus 273. I believe that's 300 Kelvin. I have to double check. So 27 plus 273. Yep, 300 Kelvin. And that uh, basically what's going to happen is the temperature is going to drop to negative 183 degrees Celsius. So again, I'm going to convert that to Kelvin as well. Right, so that's negative 183 degrees Celsius plus 273. Okay, so negative 183 plus 273. That comes out to 90 Kelvin. So the T1 and a T2, okay? They're asking what the new pressure will be, okay? Now, they didn't necessarily overtly state this, but if we're dealing with a rigid oxygen tank, that means we have constant volume in this problem. So again, if you're starting to run a blank, write the ideal gas law, EV is equal to NRT, okay? Again, we're dealing with a pressure change right? Initial pressure, and again, we're being asked to calculate a new pressure. We're dealing with a temperature change, and it's volume that's constant. So I'm going to take the ideal gas law and rearrange it so that pressure and temperature are on the same side, and then volume is with all the other constants on the opposite side. So again, that would make this P over T is equal to NR over B. Okay, so here again, these are all the constants, the things that are not changing in the problem, but here's the relationship you need to actually go ahead and solve the problem. So I'm just going to copy that over. That would be P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. In this instance, again, I'm calculating for a new pressure, so that means I'm solving for P2. In this particular case, that would be P1 times T2 over T1. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and plug in. That's 900 millimeters of mercury. I'm going to multiply that by my second temperature, which is 90 Kelvin. And I'm going to divide by my initial temperature, which was 300 Kelvin. Right, so basically, I could go ahead and do this math on the calculator, but notice that there's a way to easily reduce. Basically, 300 goes into 900 three times. So if I multiply three times 90, I should get 270, right? And my Kelvin units drop out, so this should be 270 millimeters of mercury for my new pressure, All right? So again, uh, try not to panic if you happen to forget your individual gas laws. And remember that the ideal gas law can bail you out whenever you have to do these sorts of calculations as long as you identify those variables that are changing in the problem and those variables that are remaining constant in the problem. So as we move forward through the chapter, try to give this an attempt if it turns out that you're running a blank on a problem. Okay, so I will see you guys in class. If you have any questions, feel free to email and please work on the follow-up problems attached to this assignment. Have a good day.